Uh, thank you. Uh, like you said, uh, my name is Dan Lake. I work in Intel Labs, so I'm a systems engineer. And I work in a part of the labs called the System Prototyping Lab. So we work with a variety of uh, researchers within the labs, and what I do essentially is build hardware and software prototypes to help researchers uh, prove out their ideas before they potentially and hopefully go into a product uh, group. And I work with Anna, so I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, and this is uh, Anna. Hopefully this is not going to be a product <laughs> from Anna. <laughs> this is not an announcement. Um, but anyway, uh, let's talk about DMA attacks. Um, and my name is Anna. I am a research scientist at Intel Labs. I work on the security side, um, defining the next security features that are going to be in future Intel products. Um, and I also hold a PhD in computer security. Sorry. So this talk um, is basically a repetition of the talk that we did in Black Hat. So just fair warning, if you have seen this before, you can go to the next talk, which is also amazing. Um, but this talk will describe uh, some early research that we have done um, in a new type of physical attack for DRAM memory. And we, haven't, we don't have a demo to show, unfortunately, um, and we haven't completed an, a full attack. Uh, but we will describe the hardware design and the protocol limitations that our attack is based on. And if such an attack is successful, then the result will be full access to the entire physical memory. And because the limitation is, as I said, in the hardware and the protocol, um, this attack will be applicable to all types of memories, including normal UDIMs, which is used for desktops, SODIMs for laptops, and RDIMs, um, and all memory architectures as well. Uh, first of all, let's do an introduction on what a DMA attack is. So it's a basically a type of physical attack where the attacker connects to a DMA-capable port, and through that he's able to gain full read and write access to the entire physical memory space. Um, such a port could be either a PCIe port or a firewire port or a USB, etc. And the goal for the attacker is to either extract some secrets that uh, reside in the memory, such as a disk encryption key, or to bypass, uh, corrupt the memory and bypass the platform security policies. For instance, uh, modify the, the page tables in order for to make uh, one application that was running with ring three um, writes now run in ring zero, or also install a malware in the kernel. And an example of an actual DMA attack is, um, for instance, something that Elf Frisk demonstrated um, about a year ago now um, in a MacBook Air. And through his DMA attack, he was able to obtain the file vault disk encryption password. Uh, but thankfully, this attack has been patched now, um, and your MacBook Airs are secure. Um, from the attacker's perspective, the pros of uh, such an attack is that it's relatively easy, and meaning that there's already uh, off-the-shelf hardware that you can buy of, and it's less than $300. And there's software on GitHub, and there are great tutorials that you can follow and do that attack yourself. On the con side, um, it does require the specific interface for this attack to work, obviously. And it, there are also uh, mitigations for that attack. So, the f past few years, there have been mitigations through either BIOS and programming the VDD so that a device cannot have direct access to the entire physical memory space, and there are some access control there. Or you can uh, mitigate this attack by blocking associated drivers and ports. So if you know in your laptop that you're never going to use one port, or possibly in your desktop, you're never going to use this particular PCIe port, then you can just disable it through BIOS, and you should be fine. So the motivation for our attack um, is, OK, what if we could eliminate all these cons and make something that is super duper resilient? Uh, but in order to do that, we need to explain a little bit how, on how the DRAM is designed. So basically, a DIMM consists of a series of DRAM chips, uh, which hold tiny capacitors inside. And this is mounted into a PCB. Um, and the DIMM is then inserted into a DIMM socket on the motherboard, which has internal traces, and through that the DIMM communicates with the processor. 
And here is an example of how um, it looks like in an actual system. As you can see, this is a, a normal desktop um, which has four available DIMM sockets, and one of them is populated with one DIMM. If you take a closer look to that, uh, you can again see the DIMM PCB, which is the green part, and then the empty DIMM socket, which is right next to it. But if you look super closely, you can see the tiny silver dots there, which are actually the DIMM pins. Those are the pins that make a connection between the DIMM and the, and the processor. And if you flip that same motherboard on the other side, you can again see those same pins um, because they are a through hole. So overall, all 288 pins for each of those DIMM sockets are exposed on both sides of the motherboard. And those pins are electrically, electrically connected. So what that means that all the communication that is going on uh, between the DIMM and the motherboard is visible to anyone. And this is a standard uh, design as well. This is not specific for that um, specific motherboard. So as an attacker, as we said, OK, what if you could plug into that, uh, those pins and observe that communication? That is perfectly doable. Uh, but what if you can take it a step further and, issue, and connect to those pins again and issue reads and writes and to that DIMM and impersonate an actual memory controller? That will be fun, right? <laughs> um, but in order to, to, to see how is that possible and if that is possible as well, we have to dig a little bit deeper on how the DRAM works, right? Um, that is specified by the JDEX standard, which defines the set of requirements that must be, must be satisfied by all memory modules and all architectures. So that is something that is global. So the first thing that happens is the DRAM initialization. And this is part of the BIOS, and in that stage, basically, the CPU reads the DIMM serial presence detect EEPROM data from the SM bus. This contains information such as the manufacturer of the DIMM, the module serials, like supported voltages for the DIMM, etc. cetera. Um, and this bypasses the memory controller. And the next sta state um, is that the CPU configures the memory controller. So at that stage, this is again part of the BIOS, the CPU decides on the clock frequency that it's going to use uh, to communicate with the DIMM and configures the memory controller to hold this information. Next, the memory controller is responsible to perform something that is called uh, memory calibration. Uh, basically, a, a memory controller is agnostic of the motherboard and the DIMM traces that it uh, communicates to. And that makes sense because you want a particular memory controller, which is part of the processor, to work with different kinds of motherboards and that work with different kinds of DIMMs. And the same, uh, the other way around. So you want a DIMM to operate with different motherboards, right? Uh, so the memory controller is possible to uh, calculate what are all those traces and configure itself appropriately. So it calculates uh, the round trip time between the memory controller and the DIMM, and it also calculates small discrepancies between the, the different traces. So as I said, there are 288 pins. One trace might be a little longer than the other, so the memory controller needs to, ta to take this into account as well. And the final part of the initialization is that the memory controller sets uh, the DIMMS mode registers. Uh, those are registers that enable or disable features that the DIMM supports, and it also does some fine tuning uh, for the timing. So if you want to overclock your DIMM, you need to uh, tweak those registers a little bit. Next is what happens when the, during normal operations. So when your uh, computer is active and the processor doing actively uh, reads and writes to the uh, memory. Um, in that case, the memory controller needs to schedule these uh, accesses and optimize them. And the memory controller also schedules periodic memory refreshes. So uh, because this is um, the, the, the memory contents degrade over time, this is how uh, DRAM, normal DRAMs work, the memory controller is, issues periodic uh, refreshes to hold the data there. Very nice, right? Um, and then is what happens during sleep. In particular, I'm talking about um, S3, suspend mode, uh, which is a mode where the, the CPU is powered off 
um, but the memory contents are held there. And when you wake up from that state, then it's a little bit faster than doing, say, hibernate, where the memory contents are lost. So in this particular state, S3, the memory controller is powered off, the CPU is powered off, the DIMM is powered on, and it's in self-refresh um, state, so that it holds its memory. And um, a clock, a particular signal uh, that is controlled by the memory controller is the, the clock enable signal, and this needs to be to zero. The rest of the signals are in tri-state. Um, this is a pretty important signal, because this is what the DIMM uh, is gonna monitor, and as soon as this CK signal goes to one, then the, the DIMM will wake up, and you can then issue again reads and writes to the memory. So overall, there is a protocol limitation, and that is that there is no particular authentication between the memory controller or the DIMM, and there is no state information that is held on the DIMM. Everything, including the calibration results, which are uh, identical for that system, are held on the memory controller side, not on, on the DIMM side. So basically nothing prevents an attacker from impersonating a memory controller to the DIMM, because the DIMM is agnostic to the memory controller that it works with. Okay, but how we could exploit that? Um, the idea that we had is to create a device that would uh, attach to those uh, exposed signal pins that I showed you earlier and impersonate uh, a memory controller to that DIMM. Um, however, that would be extremely difficult when the system is in, is in normal operation in S0 because the, the CPU and the original memory controller would uh, issue reads and writes constantly and, we will, uh, and our device will interleave with that and that would be cause a mess. Um, however, that attack would be possible when the system is in S3 sleep, because at that point there's nothing that um, communicates with a DDR, and we'll be the sole owner of that bus. And an example of a realistic attack would be to say a victim go to a conference and leave its uh, system to sleep, then the attacker could uh, get hold of this system and attaches um, the rogue memory controller device that I mentioned uh, to those exposed pins, and the attacker now would own that system. So the requirements for this successful exploitation would be, as I said, to attach the rogue memory controller to the victim system while that system is in S3 sleep, pull the clock enable uh, signal to one in order to wake up the DIMM, uh, perform the calibration between the ROG memory controller and the memory bus traces because we're going to introduce new traces and our memory controller needs to tune for that in order to do successful um, in communication with the DIMM. Then obviously the attacker needs to uh, send uh, memory reads and writes commands because we need to re do reads and writes for the attack and then put the, the clock enable signal to zero in order to put the DIMM to sleep and finally detach uh, from the victim system in order to wake up normally. So now uh, the owner of that system would never notice that uh, an attack has happened. And next we're gonna go through each one of those billets that I showed you earlier. Um, by then. Oh, okay, so um, in order to get the system, uh, the while the system is asleep, we want to be able to wake up the DIMM and be able to talk to it as a rogue memory controller. So the first thing our device needs to do is to issue a self-refresh exit command. And the way that it does that is through the use of this CKE signal. So there's just this one signal that if we can control this signal, we can tell the, the DIMM to wake up. So uh, here in the diagram, we show the DIMM on the right and what we call the victim memory controller on the left. And then we come in and we apply a voltage to that pin uh, to try to get it into a logic high state while the memory controller is actively trying to keep that signal in a low state. Uh, so in order to not attach the voltage directly onto a ground pin of the memory controller and potentially damaging our processor with the integrated memory controller, uh, we attach what we call the uh, attacker's resistor here. So we just want to limit the amount of current that's going to be flowing into the memory controller. So what we did in the lab is we uh, brought in a, actually a variety of different motherboards uh, to test out this methodology with a variety of different resistors and voltages to test are we able to wake up uh, the, the DIMM just using a power supply and, and our attacker resistor. Um, 
So this is a picture of uh, one of the benches in my lab uh, with a microscope, and you can see in the center picture here, uh, there's a little blue wire that we poke into one of those signals that Anna pointed out earlier. Uh, the diagram on the right shows you where the blue wire is, and just out of the frame, there, there's a resistor. And I think we probably built a half a dozen or a dozen of these little re resistor wires uh, and tested it with different voltages and different resistances. And we found that across the board with at least both the DDR3 and DDR4 in a variety of uh, registered, unbuffered, um, non-ECC varieties, we were able to uh, wake up the, uh, the DIM using this methodology. So we found that for, um, for some of them, we could use a resistor around 50 ohms and around 1.2 volts for DDR4, and we were able to wake this up. We then went through the rest of those 288 signals uh, on the DIM slot. Some of them are already various power rails. Some of them are ground rails. Uh, but we went through each of the remaining, like the address lines and the various control lines, and make sure that we could positively assert a value of 1 or a, a value of 0 while the memory controller was sleeping. So once we validated that, we know that we can completely own that bus while the processor is asleep. So the first thing that we need to do then once we've, once we've owned that bus is to attach our rogue memory controller. And it, as Anna mentioned, we need to be able to train our memory controller against the bus because uh, every different motherboard you attach to and every different DIM that you connect into that motherboard is going to have different length signals, different impedances, and all sorts of layouts that are they all within the JEDEC standard, but there's a wide variety of acceptable uh, layouts. As you know, you can look at DIMMs from a variety of manufacturers. They all look different uh, to some degree. So normally, the system does this when it first boots up. The memory controller on your motherboard talks with the DIMMs uh, because it has to be designed. That processor has to work with any motherboard and any DIMM. So once it's done that, it stores the results in the memory controller. But our memory controller perhaps has never seen this board before, so we have to do that when we first connect. One of the advantages to that, though, is that if we're targeting a specific um, victim system, if we have the opportunity to see what brand of motherboard they're using and the model and maybe get a, a, our eyeballs in and see what memory they're using, we can actually pre-calibrate before connecting to the system so we don't have to do this stage, which may take some time to find the right settings for that particular system. Uh, and then the calibration results uh, could be the same across all the different systems that are the same. So once we've connected, uh, the, the designers of these motherboards take great care to make sure that there's no stubs and impedance discontinuities on the motherboard so they get the highest quality signal going between the processor and the memory. So obviously when we come along and we attach on an additional device, we're adding loading onto that bus that the designer didn't expect to be there. And one of the ways that we can uh, mitigate some of the signal integrity issues is to run the DDR at a lower frequency. So as Anna mentioned uh, earlier, the frequency that you're running, whether you're overclocking your board or not, that's actually decided by the, um, the processor and the BIOS settings in your processor. But the memory doesn't really care what frequency you're running it at as long as you're within the, um, the JEDEC specification for that particular unit. So once we uh, connect and we um, calibrate against that, we can actually run at whatever frequency we want down to a certain threshold. And about 800 megahertz is the low threshold for DDR4 uh, because the DDR4 technology introduces something called a um, delay lock loop. And that DLL inside the RAM uh, ensures that all the timing between the clocks and the data line up, but it also means that you can't run your clock too slow. Fortunately, uh, one of the things in the JEDEC spec allows you to turn off that delay lock loop. So once we've calibrated, we want to turn off the delay lock loop, and then we can actually run our clock extremely slow. And although the memory performance is going to be lower, it allows us to scan through the memory uh, with less signal integrity violations. Yes? Um, why don't we hold till the end, yeah. We'll We'll try to finish up and give a few minutes for questions, yeah. So once we've calibrated and we reduce the clock frequency, then we can issue the reads and writes just following the JEDEC specification. Uh, if you're familiar with the DDR specifications, there's kind of a large state machine for how to activate and address the rows and the banks, and um, that's something that the memory controller in our, in our device that we've built actually, uh, we use, just use an off-the-shelf memory controller that has all this functionality in it. So uh, let me see. 
and here it is. So this is a board that uh, we built in our lab. Um, so we're using an FPGA and we're using a DDR4 in this case. So up above here you can see there's a slot um, where there would be a DDR4, like a dim socket like you would find on your motherboard. Uh, but in the boards that uh, I built, I only populated one with that socket and the rest of them I actually leave it empty so that we can play around with some of those pins on the back of the motherboard. And then the, the plan here is we build a mechanical, uh, electromechanical connector that attaches onto the back side of that motherboard. It uses these little crown tipped spring popes that can grab onto those signals. And then we actually, you can see the bottom here, the rogue memory controller board. This is the board I just showed you. It has all of these pins in it. And when we apply it to the back side, it allows us simultaneous access to the entire 288 pins of uh, one of those dim slots. Um, great, thank you, Dan. And so overall, the thread model that we have built for this attack is that this attack requires a hardware, a skilled hardware attacker, and it also obviously requires physical access to the victim system. Um, our attack is also invasive, not in the terms that it will it will modify the, uh, the the victim system in any way, but it's invasive in the terms that you have to dig out the motherboard out of the system you're going to attack. Um, so that requires a little bit of time, especially if it's a laptop, and it's going to be not be noticeable as well. Um, and finally, it may require some prior knowledge of the victim system uh, spec. So if you know that you're going to attack uh, that system with that motherboard, it's if you have this knowledge, then you can uh, pre-calibrate the the solution the the board that Dan showed you, and then you don't need to do the calibration all over again because uh, it will be the same across um, systems that have the same memory module and same processor. Um, for the future work uh, that we have is to obviously comp complete this uh, mechanical uh, connector and attach it to the board that we already have, and then run the full attacks, the full attack against the, the memory bus. And we, as Dan mentioned, uh, we anticipate to have a, a signal noise and reflection um, uh, problem, but this could be mitigated if we uh, make the, the clock, uh, if we clock it uh, low enough, then we think that it, it's not going to be a huge issue. Plus, we don't necessarily need to do um, rely to all the writes to all, all the reads to be perfectly. We can do them three times, four times, five times, and then we, when we read the data back, if it's what we expect, then we are golden. Um, in terms of mitigation for this attack, um, one that is a little bit um, silly is to just not use sleep and use hibernate instead. And also, I think it's a good idea to focus on the physical security if you care about your system, um, if it holds something that's really important. In terms of long term, um, we plan to uh, and be able to enhance the dim socket and the motherboard design in order to not have those pins there in the first place, because this is something that is doable. And we would also like to um, enhance the JDEX spec to perform some kind of authentication between the memory controller and a dim and not trust it uh, blindly. So to conclude this talk, uh, we described some early research that we have done uh, regarding a DMA attack. Uh, it requires a skilled attacker, and we it, this attack exploits a hardware design and protocol limitation. This is new line uh, of research for physical security. Um, I hope we'll be able to influence other people to go into there. And there are short-term and long-term mitigations. So thank you. <laughs>